Now we come to a very important and interesting field of uh, nanomedicine, and this is the point of uh, RNA, uh, SI RNA, RNA inhibition, uh, which is one of the most promising new concepts in the past few years, years, but it has also proved to be a little bit more challenging than uh, we first believed, that industry first believed in translation to clinical application. And that's the reason why we are very happy to have uh, very prominent, uh, two very prominent people here explaining us the state of the art of their respective approach to uh, RNA inhibition. The first one is uh, Dr. Christopher Ansalone, President and CEO, CEO of Arrowhead Research Corporation in uh, California. Please. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. I have too much to talk about in now just nine minutes. Uh, first, I need to start with this and, and, uh, and tell you not to believe anything I say to go look at our SEC filings. Okay, we, we have built uh, comprehensive platforms around RNA interference, uh, primarily through the acquisition of Roche's RNAi business in 2011. Uh, we have built this uh, under two silos, or the way I like to think of it is two silos. One is RNAi chemistry. We have broad freedom to operate uh, within the three primary um, siRNA structures. These are canonical mirror duplexes and dicer substrates. The reason that's important is that we have the ability to toggle among those three structures to optimize efficiency um, on a target-by-target -target basis, and <clears throat> I don't think that, that uh, any other company has the ability to do that within those structures. Second, and probably more importantly, is, is delivery. Uh, we actually have a portfolio of delivery systems, but we are really focused on a single one of these systems called DPCs, or dynamic polyconjugates. Um, it's a non-lipid-based system. Uh, we have a library of polymers that we use as the polymer backbone. Um, importantly, these are all targetable. Uh, so while our, our initial uh, indication with this system is, uh, is the liver, we can go extra hepatically. Um, uh, that's important to us. And we think it's the, it is the most efficient and best tolerated system uh, in the field. Uh, uh, so, so we've got a number of programs, but we're talking today um, solely about the HPV program. Uh, well, how come? Well, it's in a, in a world of biotech companies and small, and, uh, small pharmaceutical companies that are focused on orphan indications and ultra-orphan indications, this is not one of them. Uh, this truly is a global marketplace of about 350 million infections worldwide. Uh, that's about one in 20 people on the planet have hepatitis B. Uh, and that, of course, is different from, uh, uh, from place to place. For instance, Hong Kong um, has about one in three people have hepatitis B uh, um, um, infection. So it is, it is a substantial uh, need. Uh, and there are substantial health implications. Uh, hepatitis B is the world's most common uh, serious liver infection. Uh, about one-third of patients will at some point have liver damage due to cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, uh, HPV is the, is, the, uh, is the primary cause of primary liver cancer, or the greatest cause of primary liver cancer, uh, and there is no cure. There are, there are well-established therapies that need to be taken for the rest of one's life, but there is no cure right now. And that is our goal, to provide a functional cure. Um, we think that if we can do that, we could, of course, uh, capture substantial market share. But we can also, we think, increase the market because a majority of those 350 million uh, patients, um, uh, if they are diagnosed, are treated with a wait-and-see approach. Uh, and we think that if there is a curative uh, therapy on the market, then uh, more of them will be potential patients. So here's the theory uh, that we're working on. Um, uh, as the, let's see. Does this go? Here we go. Um, as the virus gets into hepatocyte, um, it will either form these circular CCC DNA structures or sometimes will integrate into the host DNA. Uh, either way, um, the, uh, the uh, DNAs are transcribed uh, into RNAs and then either translated into these viral proteins that are exported or reverse transcribed and then released um, as new variants. Uh, the important point here is that, the, is that there are a number of established therapies, uh, nucleotide and nucleoside inhibitors, so-called nukes, that, that uh, block this pathway. So, so if somebody's on these, they have to be on them for the rest of their life. Uh, and they, they do a very good job of keeping these individuals from infecting their partners or spouses uh, because they block quite well the export of a new virus. They do nothing for the viral proteins. Uh, and the reason that that's important is that it is thought that these viral proteins uh, are, are essentially evolutionarily designed to immunosuppress the, the host. Um, uh, these are produced at much higher quantities than, than new variants. Uh, and the thought is if you can knock out uh, these viral proteins, most importantly the S-antigen, 
then you can, you can cause the immune system to come back up and then clear the virus. So it was our goal to sit upstream of nukes, to, uh, to block uh, the process up here. And if you can do that, then you can block the export of, of, new, of new antigens. You can also b uh, block the export of new virus. That was, that was the theory that we were moving on. Towards those ends, we, we screened 140 sequences that in silico uh, should silence the entire genome. And they, they spanned from not very effective to very effective. Uh, we took four of those four into, into in vivo studies uh, and, then, and then set on two of them uh, that are going to be in the drug. The drug is called ARC520. Uh, those two are important because they will cover uh, roughly 99.9 .9 or 99.6 percent of all known genotypes uh, in gene bank right now. So does it work? The answer is we think it does. Uh, uh, we first did studies in a non-transgenic model, and what we found was, was substantial knockdown of serum S antigen levels, of uh, serum uh, uh, DNA levels, and of serum E antigen levels. And so, in fact, we saw three to four log reduction in S antigen um, after a single dose, uh, and over two log reduction uh, spanning over a month. Um, that's never been showed before. There's never been a way to knock out S antigen consistently uh, before, and we, and we knocked it out substantially. Uh, decreased uh, viral DNA, we saw about a three log reduction uh, for about a month after single dose. Um, uh, no one's ever shown, to our knowledge, that rapid a knockdown of, of, uh, of the viral DNA. And then the, the E antigen was knocked down below the level of detection. We also went into a non-transgenic, I'm sorry, a transgenic model, um, and we saw very similar results. Um, a substantial knockdown of gene products, um, and then we also stained for core antigen uh, in the liver, and we also essentially wiped that out. So that's all fine, but these are rodent models. Um, there are three chimpanzees in the United States um, that have hepatitis B that can be studied, or in, the, or in the past have been able to be studied, maybe in the world, but certainly in the United States only three, and we got our hands on one of them. Um, so in a lot of respects, it's a great model. It's a chimpanzee, so physiologically it's quite similar to us, of course. Uh, the HPV that chimps get is the same virus uh, as us. In fact, this one was a, was a B genotype, uh, the same that, that we would see in humans. Um, uh, it, uh, these animals react to the virus in, in much the same way as humans do, with the exception that, that, that uh, they don't have the end-stage cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma, but up till then, they react quite similarly. So it was, it was a great model for those reasons. It was a really bad model uh, for a few reasons. One, uh, because this animal was extremely infected. Um, its liver was very hot. Uh, about almost 100% of its hepatocytes stained positive for HPV. Second, it was, it was just by, by dumb luck, it was, it was a mutant that was a mismatch to one of our sequences. And so we would be going into this animal with one hand tied behind our back, half of our drug would be ineffective. Um, um, but we decided to test it anyway. And it appeared to work. Uh, what we saw here was, was, was again unprecedented, and I don't use that term lightly, but uh, uh, we saw a substantial knockdown um, of viral DNA very quickly. We, we saw a substantial knockdown of E-antigen and of S-antigen. In fact, we saw between 90 and 95 percent reductions in all these. Uh, it was a very safe, um, low dose. Uh, we didn't see any liver enzymes. Um, we didn't see, uh, see any creatinine increases. Um, and so we had, again, shown something that, that had not been shown before in, um, in uh, primates. So we're moving to the clinic right now. Uh, we filed with Australia for first in man studies on the 27th of May. We believe that, that, that we will have clearance in the next uh, couple of weeks. It's a, it's a phase, it's a, it's a simple safety phase one study um, uh, in healthy volunteers. We'll then move into Hong Kong for our phase 2A. We think that we can file that uh, in the fourth quarter of this year. That will be in infected patients. Uh, it'll be a single dose. Uh, we are starting uh, multi-dose uh, GLP tox studies right now because we'll then move into a phase 2B. We think around this time or next year, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a, bit, a bit later, there will be a multi-dose uh, study. Uh, we think we've de-risked the drug uh, tremendously from a safety standpoint. We have substantial data, non-GLP data, in dozens of, of, uh, of non-human primates. So we've got a very good understanding of the safety profile of the drug. Uh, we have, of course, GLP tox data in, primate, in non human primates as well as in, <clears throat> in rodent models. From, a, from an efficacy standpoint, we've got uh, good data from now two rodent models and a chimpanzee model. And what's also helpful about RNAi is that if you can get the right sequence for the right cell at the right time, it's fairly predictive that you can knock down that gene product. Uh, so we feel that that, that, that risk is not, um, is not 
terribly high for the, for the human program. Uh, animal predictability is an important question because the only other real species that's, that's, that has been studied for, a, for HPV um, is a, a woodchuck. It's a different virus and so it couldn't be studied here and also has been uh, has been uh, uh, has led to some false positives. The, the species we use, the transgenic and non-transgenic rodent models, and the chimpanzee have shown to be good and predictive models. And finally, our timing is 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 good. We are we're moving into the clinic right now. We think it's an embarrassingly it's an embarrassingly large opportunity. I won't go into these numbers, but they become very large very quickly uh, because of of how widespread this disease is. Um, you know, people think about this uh, as as a disease that is primarily uh, one of the of the uh, underdeveloped world, and we just and that, that's just not the case. There's about two million infected uh, patients uh, in the U.S. right now. There's 14 million in Western Europe alone. Uh, we think those alone are very large markets. Um, and then, of course, when you get into uh, to Asia and China, it becomes it becomes blindingly large. And I see that my my time is over. So thank you very much. And I've got a bit of time, I think, for questions. I would like to ask a first question. What do you see as the key? Uh, factor of success of your approach compared to the many failed approaches in the field? So, so that's a great question. Uh, there has never been a way that, w that I know of um, that has shown even in animal models to knock out uh, these viral proteins. That's, that's what's important for us. If we were coming out at this as a, as a next generation nucleotide or nucleoside inhibitor, um, it wouldn't be terribly interesting because Intecavir and Tenofovir are, are, are great drugs. They're very good at knocking out exportive new variants. And so we think that the only way to really get into this market now is to go for that functional cure. And the way to get there is to knock out S-antigen. So, so we've got something unique in that, in that we can do that in a very consistent way, at least in animal models. Um, uh, there, there have been an, a number of, of attempts at, at, immune, at immunostimulatory uh, uh, strategies. Uh, and, and those have generally had safety issues, you know, just like interferon. Um, uh, and, and we think that, that, um, that, what's, that what is in, um, in the queue now is also going to have some of those safety issues. And so we've got, we've got you know, the, the, the pinpoint focus, focusability, if you will, of RNAi. Um, and we think that, 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 that HPV is just uniquely uh, positioned you know, to, uh, you know, to be treated this way. What is the physical and chemical nature of the, the, the uh, nanomedicine itself? Yeah. You said it was a polymer with RNAi bound to it, and how is it targeted? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A good question. I, I'm, I didn't have time to put, to put a slide on that. It's probably the most important for this conference. Uh, um, we have a, so it's a polymer backbone, um, and we've got a library of polymers. What we're using for this is a peptide. Um, and and uh, what's important about this and the other polymers is that there are amine groups that are masked. Um, so so they are. We've got this masking chemistries. Some are, are peptide. Some are peptidase sensitive. Some are pH sensitive. But in in some way, by some means, these masking chemistries fall off, exposing the amines. The reason that's important is that you know a, a great challenge within within RNAi is is endosomal escape. You know you you can very often get. Um, siRNAs into a cell, but then they get packaged up into an, into an endosome and, and degraded. And so, so uh, these polymers are very good at, at, uh, enzo at, at, at endosomal escape. What we're using here, the mass in chemistry, is pH sensitive. So as this gets into the endosome, pH, the uh, endosome uh, matures and acidifies, the mass in chemistry falls off, exposes the amines, and then lyses the endosome. Now, so, so that's once we get into the cell. The way we get into the cell with this particular one is via the NS, uh, the NS galactosamine receptor. There are many copies of this on hepatocytes, and so it's a really nice conduit in uh, for non-hepatic targeting. Of course, we'll use different uh, targeting ligands, but that's, that's the way we're getting in with this one. Now, one more, one more uh, uh, interesting aspect. The ARC520, we are, we are using siRNA that is co-injected with the polymer. Going forward, um, I suspect that most of our drugs will be conjugated. But, but for this one, we have siRNA that is conjugated to cholesterol. And so that will go to a number of different cells, but, but, but many of them will get into, into hepatocytes. Um, uh, we we're not worried about off-target effects because, because if they get into other cells, they won't escape the, uh, the endosome because the polymer is, is targeted only to hepatocytes or, you know, effectively uh, only to hepatocytes. So by some means that is not clear, uh, these, the, the polymer and the, and the siRNA finds themselves in the same endosome. 
Um, and then the, the polymer will lysine the zone and the SIRNA will get into the cytosol and do its business. Now, we could, we could conjugate them, and, it's, and it is, it's a bit more efficient, and going forward we will likely do that. But given that the tox is driven by the polymer and not the SIRNA, um, it seemed like a simpler approach for the first uh, candidate uh, coming out of the program. The common side effect that halted clinical development of nucleic acid-based therapies are immunotoxicities that are related to cytokine induction, complement activation, you know, which cause fever-like reactions. Uh, you mentioned that um, in your studies with non-human primates, uh, this uh, particle was found to be safe. Did you observe any of these uh, common side effects? Did you see changes in coagulation? Did you, see, did you check for cytokines? We did. We did. Um, so... Um, um, and we've been comfortable that, that, we, that, that, we, that we have really not seen those. Um, you know, the siRNAs are modified um, through you know, pretty established means, and so, and so the siRNAs can be made to be, to be non-toxic. The, the, the tox that we see uh, related to the polymer is uh, we first see liver enzymes, uh, and then we see some CK increases, and we see some, um, some, some creatinine increase. Um, at, the, at the levels, at the doses that we're expecting um, in humans, we... Uh, we just don't see that. In your efficacy data, how does this efficacy compare to um, interferon therapy? It's a great question. So, um, uh, it's a, of course, it's a very different mechanism. Um, um, but my take-home message for interferon is, is, is if patients are on interferon for a year, and that's a tough year you know, because, of, because of how difficult interferon is, uh, generally about 10%, maybe as high as 15%, giving some HPV genotypes, will spontaneously get to a functional you know, cure, will seroconvert. And, and in all of those patients um, who do seroconvert, uh, they see about a 20% reduction in, in S antigen. So that, for me, was, was our bogey. You know, if we can hit 20% reduction, then, then, then at least you know, from a correlative standpoint, we may have something that, that's, that's, going to, that's going to work. And, and we go way beyond that, of course. You know, we're seeing 99% knockdown. Uh, um, interferon, I don't, I, I don't, I've never seen any data of interferon getting much higher than that. Um, of course, you know, that's not, again, the mechanism is different, but I've never seen much higher than, you know, 20 to maybe 30% reductions. Uh, in fact, so uh, if I understand well the nanotechnology, there are nanotechnology associated with both benefits and, and also risks. So benefit-wise, probably it's evident in preclinical models. So in the de-risking de strategies to in, for phase one, phase two, have you considered, anticipated any risks associated with, uh, not entirely as a product, but a nanotechnology associated risk? For example, especially uh, in phase two, when you consider a repeated injection schedule that you don't observe in phase one. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good question. So. Um... Uh, so nanotechnology-based risk, um, you know, maybe aggregating and this sort of thing. Well, these don't aggregate, and so, so I'm not worried about that. Um, in terms of, of long-term use, we're not terribly worried for this one because this is, it's a biodegradable polymer. Um, it doesn't stick around very long, and so the, the, the talks that you see when you see it, you see in, the, you know, in, in hours. You know, it's all gone you know, within hours. So, so we don't, we've done some repeat injections. We haven't gone nine months yet, but we will do that. Uh, we haven't seen any cumulative effect because it just doesn't seem to doesn't seem to stick around anywhere. Just a quick question: Does the virus come back when you stop the treatment? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, um, so, so the reason we call it a functional cure rather than a true cure is that that is that if, if we if we're successful and we can do and this works. Uh, the patient will still have the CCC DNA in their hepatocytes. So it's not a true cure. Um, but, but, it will be, but the immune system will then be on top of it. So, so it, will be, um, it won't have, the patient won't, uh, uh, won't have any of the symptoms, won't, be, uh, won't have any increased risk of uh, HCC or, or cirrhosis, but that DNA will still be in there. Um, you know, think of it like chicken pox. You know, when I was a kid, I had chicken pox, and I still have that virus you know, in my ganglia somewhere. Um, but, it's, but it doesn't uh, present. Now, now if, if, if this works like we hope it works and, and we do get to that functional cure, if that patient eventually you know, is, it goes under cancer therapy and is immunosuppressed, then it could come back. Um, so then we'd have to hit him again. 
it was actually related to that, which are sort of long-term effects. Um, you said you'd de-risked, and I wondered in what sense are you thinking about de-risking for these long-term immunosuppressive and knock-on effects much later? There are many more besides the yeah, cancer yeah. issues. There's a, a, a raft of issues that can come up in later life that could could impinge on this. Yeah, so, uh, um, so we're not focused on that. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if we're lucky and, and this works, then, then we, can, we can think about, about you know, what happens to a patient you know, many years after they have this functional cure. And so we haven't given that any thought, unfortunately. Um, so. I have a final question, yeah. and this is the fact that hepatitis is an important disease in developed countries and is a much more important disease in developing countries. So if this uh, approach succeeds, there might be a huge demand from countries with a w very bad economy. Uh, do you have strategic plans how to handle this? Will this be a, th a therapy uh, re restricted to rich countries, or is there an approach where you can make your uh, approach available to, uh, to Africa? Yeah. Um, we don't have a strategy for that yet. You know, we, you know I, I, I would assume that by the time we get to that point, uh, we will have partnered the program. I think that, that at some point you may see drugs that are sold directly by Arrowhead. This will not be one of them. Uh, and so I, you know, I, uh, there are many steps between, them, between, then, between now and then. Um, and so that's something we'll have to work out with, with you know, whomever we partner the program with. Um, so. Thank you very much. Let's now.